All right, the title of my message today is A Silent Gospel. I want you to stop and think about that just for a moment. When you hear those words, what does that mean to you? A silent gospel. I want to tell you about an amazing newspaper that maybe some of you have never heard of before. It's called The Great Invisible Newspaper. I tell you, this thing is amazing. It has the best authors that are out there, the most interesting articles that have ever been. It'll shock your world. Are you subscribed? Have you, have you subscribed yet? Yes, you have. Okay, good. What's the problem with that? What good is a newspaper that you can't see, right? It could have the very best authors, the most interesting articles, but if you can't see it, what good is it? In the same way, that goes with our title of the message today, A Silent Gospel. The gospel of Christ cannot save someone who never sees it, who never hears it. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, it says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Don't you love that scripture? That out of a hundred people who call on the name of the Lord with sincere heart, how many of them are going to be saved? One hundred percent. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But yet there is a problem. Here is the problem. Let's look at verse 14. How then can they call on the one? How can they call on the one they have not believed in? So that tells us something about what we just heard. In in order for us to call on the name of the Lord, we first need to what? Believe. Believe that He is. That He died on the cross to pay for our sins. That He rose from the dead. That He is fully God and fully man. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And here's where it gets to it. And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? The gospel of Christ is an amazing gospel. If people never hear it, it does them no good. And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? How in the world are your friends, your neighbors, the people you work with going to hear unless you speak to them? Verse 15. And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? And and wow, you just go, thank you. No, we are all sent, aren't we? Right? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. There's no one off the hook here. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Check out your feet just a moment. Do you have beautiful feet? Have you told someone about the things that God is doing in your life? I want to talk to you about some enemies to a spoken gospel, a gospel that people can see and hear as well. I think one of the biggest enemies to a spoken gospel is timidity, being afraid. What are people going to think? And so we're shy and we never speak. Now, as you listen to these, ask God to show you, is this me? And God, what can I do to change? 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6 says this, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So Paul is saying this to his son in the faith, Timothy. And he's saying, you know, you remember that time when I laid my hands on you and the power of God was there? Hey, Timothy, don't just let that sit there. You've got to fan that into flames. Um, we heat our, our house with wood. Anybody like that primarily? It's, it's an amazing thing. It heats up really nice and fast. But you can begin, even if you're not there looking at the fire, you can begin to tell when that fire dies. All of a sudden, you know, Melanie will look over to me or I'll look over at her. And, and you notice the temperature change just a little bit. The winds have shifted. And you've got a decision to make in that time. Do you say, oh, I'm feeling like a little lazy. I don't know if I want to go down there. Or do I want to let this thing die? Or do I want to get up 
and fan those flames. I want to put in some more wood and make sure it survives. It's a whole lot more work once you let that thing die, isn't it? (laughs) So in our faith, it's the same way. How many of you have been blessed by Jesus? You've been rescued. You've been saved, right? That is a gift that's been given to you. And my question is, have you judged the temperature in your room? When's the last time that people have been able to see a difference in your life? When's the last time that you've said something about Christ? I want to challenge you. Fan into flame that gift of God. For the Spirit of God does not make us timid. Maybe you know the the King James version of this. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, right? So here in the NIV it says, For the Spirit of God... Get the spirit God gave us does not make us timid. That's not who God has called us to be. But he gives us power, love, and self-discipline. If you find yourself when it comes to living out loud your faith, you find yourself timid, receive the spirit of God and the power that's there and begin to speak. Another enemy to a spoken gospel is that of shame. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about shame for past that that you have done, although that can be part of it. I'm talking about maybe you're ashamed of what other people would think. Uh, Let me give you an example. I I attended a a church in Georgia, Assemblies of God Church, and I attended a uh, a Baptist Christian school all my life. Uh, So I remember... One time, I think I was like in fourth grade, and uh, we had this special concert going on uh, at our church, real lively concert. And one of my friend's mothers that attended the school went to our church, and their father came from a Catholic background. And so he was there the night of this concert, and I was like so excited. I said, Eric, why don't you come and sit here uh, beside me? This is going to be great. And I was so excited that one of my friends was there. It was an upbeat concert. I was, you know, clapping my hands, raising the Lord, praying. I'm, I, I don't know, maybe even cry, but I, I know that my eyes were closed, lifted up my hands. And I was, like, excited that my friend could be there. The very next day at school, you know, I go to, to, to kind of find out, you know, what's he going to think? Maybe we're going to be closer through this. And he begins to talk to all of the other people in the class. And so, yeah, I went to Joel's church He had his hands lifted up like this. He was crying or his eyes were closed and they were just going crazy. A bunch of holy rollers over there. And in in that moment, it's like I wanted to kind of come in my shell, right? And I felt that shame for something that I should not have been ashamed for at all. Have you ever been in that place before where the people around you have a different view of who Christ is, and to stand up for Christ, it's, a, it's almost like you feel this little bit of shame. I, I, I don't know if I want to be a part of that. i got to tell you, we've got to have thick skin, right? If you believe in Christ, you're going to be made fun of. If you stand for Christ, you're going to have to suffer for that from time to time. Second Timothy, again, uh, chapter 1 and verse 8 says this, So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Let's just stop and think about that. What did he endure for us? Right? He gave his life. He suffered shame for us. How can we be ashamed of him? So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. I love Romans chapter 1 and verse 14 where he says, Paul says, I am obligated. I've got a responsibility to the Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. I want to tell you today, that's just not not for him. That's for you as well. You've got a responsibility, not just the people in church, right? You've got a responsibility to the people around you as well. We are obligated. Verse 15, that is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you, who are in Rome. I love this. Can you read this with me? For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Let's stop there and read it again. 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Okay? Would you stop and think just for a minute? In your workplace, at your school, around your family members who think that you're a little loco. Right? Read it again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because this gospel, this good news, is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Right? This thing that we are tempted to be timid and shy about, that we are tempted to hide and be ashamed of, is the very thing that this world needs. We can't afford to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Imagine, you've got that newspaper, and right now it's invisible and it cannot save anyone else until it is revealed, it's opened. You are that vehicle of God to reveal this gospel. Mark chapter 8, verse 38, this is the words of Jesus, and this should be convicting to all of us. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, I'm so glad that that's a thing of the past, right? We live in an adulterous and a sinful generation. Jesus says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. I don't want that. I don't want to have to be in that place where I was ashamed of the most precious gift. And I definitely don't want to be in that place where Jesus is ashamed of me. Matthew 10, 32, again from the words of Jesus. Whoever acknowledges me before others, who's not afraid to say, I'm a believer of God. Every good thing that I have in my life is because of God. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Don't you just love that just for a moment? Hey, here's Joel. He did this and this for me. I'm proud of him. Don't don't we all want to hear that when we go before the Father? The difficult part is verse 33. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do you know anybody in Scripture that disowned Jesus? Who? Peter. Right? Judas basically betrayed him, but Peter disowned Jesus. Now, what do you, I hope you get hope in that, right? The hope is this maybe you're here and there was that time that your friends were around and they were talking about other Christians and you didn't say anything or. You were asked that question, are you a believer? You know, I didn't see you on Sunday. And you shrank, or you shrunk back, and you didn't say anything. There's hope for you. Start from right now in acknowledging your faith in Jesus, living out loud. Amen? Okay, enemies to spoken gospel. One, timidity. Two, shame. Is that a misprint? Humility? Could humility be an enemy? To a spoken gospel? I believe, but it's a little bit different than the humility you may be thinking of. I believe that false humility and maybe a misunderstanding of what humility is could be an enemy. Let's give you an example for a minute. Uh, Let's say uh, our friend Bob, who's sitting on the front row here. I hope you can see him. Okay, Bob, yes, Bob loves trees. He loves trees so much that he worships trees. He worships the tree God and believes that the tree gave him life and that one day he will die and become part of one with nature and he'll be live on through the trees and everything else, okay? I could be humble and say, man, Bob, that is a a very interesting belief that you have. That's good. And I don't want to say that mine is better than yours. I'm going to be humble and say, yours is probably as good as mine, right? Isn't that humble to think? You wouldn't want to, in pride, say, I know, I, I know the real way here. What you got is a lie. That would demean him, right? 
Is that humility? I, I believe that that is a false humility. Hello, we've got something better. We've got the real thing. We don't need to be shy about it. There's a real heaven. There's a real hell. No matter what it looks on the outside, what is seemingly working for them right now is not going to work for them later. They have to be able to see the gospel before them. Let's talk about the second one, a misunderstood uh, humility. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, I was probably 20 years old when I started as a youth pastor, did some other things before that. But I kind of had this as my focus. Look at this scripture. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Have you heard that scripture before? And so I kind of made that my unspoken motto, and I don't know if it's the way I was raised or, or what. That's not a bad thing, but here's what it looked like for me in reality. If I made a call and spent 30 minutes on the phone counseling somebody, I didn't tell anybody. If I went to go visit somebody at the hospital, I didn't tell anybody. If I planned an event for the youth, I didn't tell anybody. Now, I want you to think through for a minute. What happens, let's say you're a youth pastor, you don't tell anybody what you do. What happens? They think you do nothing, right? Oh, those, those pastors, they, they have 30 to 45 minutes, poor them, to speak. And then the rest of the time they can sit back and watch TV. <laughs> right? What, what happens there? You know, in humility, when you don't say anything, some people could misunderstand why. Because they can't see what you do. So let's talk about that just a minute. Some people didn't know what I was doing. Now, if people, let's follow this out a little bit further. If people don't know what I'm doing as a youth pastor, what could that lead to? What? No youth? What else? Me personally. Yes. Gossip? Well, tell me some good gossip, Bridget. <laughs> what, uh, what else? There you go. Pink slip. Why? Because they have no earthly idea what I'm doing. Right? Some could wonder if there is any value to my role. Why? Because they don't see anything happening. So, only reason why I share that is to bring it home. Let's look at this. What about our local church? What if everything that we did was in secret? Right? What if we, the church, we never heard that the church ministered to those struggling in their marriages? What if we never heard that the church reached out to the needy? Or that we did things for the local police or the fire department? What if the church wasn't seen at all? Would we be fulfilling Matthew 6, 1? Everything that we do, let it be done in secret, right? Not to be seen by other people. Would we as a church be fulfilling what God wanted us to do? Another question to ask is, what happens if the community never sees us doing anything? Answer, yeah. We become Ichabod, yes. What else? Go back to the illustration we just looked at. Yeah, they don't come. They think you're irrelevant. What else? Yes. They don't know you're there, right? They don't see any value at all. But you know what they might see? Man, this property could be used for a lot of different stuff. Right? These people don't even pay taxes, and then they ask people to come in and give. The church is a drain on society. Why? Because they don't know what we do. They don't see any value to it. As an outsider, if you weren't part of this church, and just looking in from a secular point of view, would you see any value in a church? Maybe you'd think it was more a drain than a help. You wouldn't go to a church when you were looking for answers because, number one, you wouldn't think that they had the answers. Number two, you wouldn't even know of it because you've never heard of them before. 
if everything we as a church did was supposed to be done in secret, you know what we should do? Why don't we just go ahead and take down that sign? Even better, why don't we get a bunch of camo and cover this whole church, and then, hey, instead of 10 o'clock, we should come at nighttime. You can kind of park down at the neighbor's, and we can sneak in about 1030 when no one else is looking. Because we wouldn't want people to find out that we're worshiping God, right? That would just be too showy, wouldn't it, right? Would God be honored by a secret church like that in the United States? No. I mean, in other cultures where the persecution is high, they have to be smart on how they do things. But in our, where we live in the United States, it would be completely wrong for us to do that. So how do we balance Matthew 6, 1 that says you're not supposed to do things to be seen by others? Let's look at another thing that Jesus said. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. It says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. That's what God has called us to be. He's called us to be the thing that people look to that's obvious for everyone to see. You are the light of the world. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. That's what God has called this church to be. We are supposed to see the church in action. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Now, wait a minute. I feel like I've seen those two words before, right? Before others. Where did I see that? Wasn't that kind of in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1? To be seen by others? Yeah, it was. Let's read on. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may what? See your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Matthew 6, 1. Be careful not to, to do your acts of righteousness to be before others to be seen by them. What's going on here? Is Jesus talking about two different things? Is he contradicting himself? No, the answer is in the next part right there. Let's read it again. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and what? Glorify your Father in heaven. If you're looking at Matthew 6, 1 as an excuse, let me tell you right now. The reason why it's there is because people were looking for praise from men. But don't misquote that scripture to a point or misapply that scripture to you till you don't do anything in front of other people. Or we as a church do nothing. We other people should see the good deeds that we do, but they should lead people to glorify God. So how do we fight being the secret, silent church that nobody talks about? I'll tell you what we have done. Our fall festival in October, where we sent out invitations, and we invited children in. That was to let people know that we're here. The Thanksgiving baskets that we pass out is to let the community care, know that we care about the poor. The Toys for Tots that uh, Sayer spearheaded was let, to let people know that we care about the military. The Christmas parties that we have are another opportunity to bring people in. The Ebenezer play that we did, we advertised. Why? To let people know that we're here and that God cares about them. The War Room movie, again, another excuse to invite somebody to church. And I want you to know, in the future, I'm going to be challenging all our ministries to plan drawing and reaching out events. You know, whether it's kids ministry, youth ministry, uh, seniors, whatever it is, it shouldn't just be for the people that's there, right? Right? God has called us to be a light, and we've got to do things to light up this world. Here's some things that we're going to be doing in the future. We're going to be doing a a supporting marriage event in February. Uh, Next Sunday night, plan on inviting somebody to this. We're going to be showing the movie Woodlawn that deals with racism and uh, talks a little bit about Billy Graham and the the power of God to to bring change in people's life. We're going to be doing a, a police department outreach ping pong tournament which I'm thinking the Nevers might want to come to, right? <laughs> Very good. Uh, and the reason why we're doing this is to get out in the community, to be a light. 
So we've talked about the church, but now I want to pinpoint a le- little further. What about you? What about me? What about this gospel on the individual level? For some people, they are so afraid of being showy that they don't do anything. No one ever sees, sees them read their Bible. They don't bring it to school. They don't bring it to work because that would just be too showy. They never talk about what's going on in church because, you know, you don't want to brag about your church or you don't want to brag about what God has done for you, so you don't say anything. They never talk about what God has done for them. Yeah, that's, that's too showy. Just bring attention to yourself. At lunch times, they don't bow their heads to pray because, again, people are going to be looking at them. And didn't Matthew 6, 1 say not to do those things in front of other people? You know, that's, that's too showy. You know, when conversations or jo- jokes turn foul, they don't want to walk away or say something because then it would look like they're presenting themselves as more holy, right? And, and just that's too showy that we shouldn't do that. Maybe they even go to the bar, occasionally have a drink with them because they don't want to seem different. If, if that friend asks them out for a drink, it would just be rude not to have that drink because then it's going to be this thing where you look better than them. And that's not really humility. And so they go ahead and have the drink with that person. Maybe they even listen to the same filthy music because they don't want to say that they listen to Christian music because at the moment that they say they listen to Christian music, then it looks like that they're thinking that they're better than everybody else. It would just be too showy, too in-your-face Christianity. So my thinking on this is maybe it's not that we're afraid of being showy at all. Maybe that's just the excuse that we're feeding ourselves. Maybe it's that we're afraid of being different. Should we ask ourselves that question? What will happen if people find out that we are Christians? Matthew 5, 11 through 16. Blessed. You know what that word blessed means? Happy. Happy are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. How in the world were they persecuted for righteousness? Because what? Somebody saw them. How did Daniel get into trouble? Because somebody saw him and heard him praying. Happy are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Why? Because they saw you. They saw your faith. They heard it. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, this is going to lead back into the scripture we've already looked at. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. Now, we've talked about this before, but what does salt do? Before there were refrigerators, why did they have salt? To make ham taste good. Sorry. (laughs) Yes, to preserve, right? That salt would protect the society. Now, just think about what we have happening right now in the United States. What if the sin and wickedness continues to go up and we don't say anything at all? What happens? We're not salt. We're supposed to, every single one of us is like salt. And around us, there should be some protection because we're standing up and saying, hey, this is not right. This is wrong. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, and by that, what does that mean? That means if there is no difference between you and the person that doesn't have Christ, let me tell you this, you are not salty at all. You've lost your saltiness. How can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. That's harsh, I know. 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Now, if we were to to come up with a picture of a lamp, you know what I would choose? I would choose a candle, okay? If I put a candle up here, let's say it's about this high, and I take a bowl and I put it on top of that to hide it, what's going to happen? It's going to go out. It's just a matter 
of time. I'm going to tell you today, if you are not willing to stand up for Christ, if you are the type of person that no one would ever know that you're a Christian, you know what this is? It's a big bowl over your life. And that fire is going to be drained out of you. God has called you to be a light, to put it on its stand, let people see, and it will give light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I think about the parable of the talents, and I think about the blessings that God has given each and every one of us. I mean, think He's saved us, He's rescued us. All the times we've heard the word of God, you know what that is? That's a gift to each and every one of us. And my question is, what are we doing with that gift? Are we the person that is trying to shine that light, telling other people, and you know what happens when we let that light shine? People may come to Christ. They're helped in their life. That's fruit. Or are we the wicked, lazy servant? I don't know. You know, I'm worried about this. I might mess up when I try to do something right. And so I'm just going to kind of hold on to my faith. I'm not going to tell anybody else, not going to do anything with it. Remember what Jesus said to that person. We've got to show that light. Have three quick qu- cautions as we present the gospel. It's this. Number one, check your motives. If you are doing your acts of righteousness so that people can say, Oh, what a great Christian then maybe you shouldn't be doing that. Number two, check your message. If your message is, I hate these people, they're terrible people, you see all the wickedness in them, they are terrible people, hate them. Is that right? Are you being a light there? You're different, you're showing it, right? No. Check your message. If that's you, please sit down, go ahead and cover yourself up. It's okay. Or even better, get to know God. He hates sin, but he loves the sinner and longs for them to come to repentance, come home. Last one, check for backflow. Anybody know what backflow is? Wow, I get to teach you something today. Okay, I want you to picture your water system. Those of you that have, uh, from, from the town, you get water. So I want you to picture this pipe going this way. So picture arrows in your head, underground, the water going this way. And then all of a sudden you live in Georgia, it's hot, and there's a drought going on, and there's this pipe coming up and a sprinkler on it meant to water your grass, okay, because it's going to die unless you have good water. Now, what's another thing you need besides water? What do, what do people do for their lawn? They fertilize it. So they, they throw fertilizer, some pesticide on it, And then all of a sudden, there's this drop of water pressure. And what happens is this puddle of water around the sprinkler begins to suck down that water, which just happens to have what in it? Pesticide, fertilizer. It goes down to the point of that pipe. Then all of a sudden, the pressure goes, and that water begins going to your house and my house, and we drink it. Yeah, that's why... Believe it or not, at our church every year, we have an inspection for backflow to make sure that that doesn't happen. And we don't have pesticides on our grass because it just grows naturally. But it's to prevent that. And so my question is for you, when it comes to this silent gospel, when you're trying to live out your faith, make sure that you have not been influenced by the world around you. I want to tell you, I hear things, and I'll just talk about what God has called me to do, and other people that are in the same line of work. I've heard of pastors cursing from the pulpit. I've heard of pastors uh, and their wives going out for drinks at the bar and and showing pictures of this to to other people, uh, going out, dancing at, at, at the bars. And you know the message that that sends to everybody else? That is not necessarily what we need to be showing, Right? If we're supposed to be the light, we need to make sure that that culture hasn't influenced us to the point that what we are presenting is not Christ, but a muddled up uh, gospel. So I won't be your conscience in any of this, but I want you to, to search the scripture. Make sure to God is what I am presenting 
what you want me to present. We're supposed to be salt and light, not mud. The challenge is this. The gospel was never meant to be silent. So let's live out loud. Uh, worship team, would you mind coming? And uh, could everyone stand with me? Bow your heads, close your eyes just for a moment. In closing, what I want to say here today is that this message is just as much for me as it is for you. I know I'm saying it with power as I am up here because I've got a, I've got a responsibility from God to present it with that power, with that authority that he's given. But just as much as that message was meant for you, that message is meant for me. There are times that I can be timid. There are some times where I can act like I am ashamed, even though I'm not ashamed, but that I can not live out my faith before others. So I want you to, to let you know I'm not pointing fingers. I'm, I'm with you in the seat and saying, God, please help me. Please challenge me. Change me. I want to be a light. I don't want to hide this light inside of me. I have that same thing. Lord, help me not to go to the, the right or to the left. Lord, help me to be who you have called me to be. Lord, may your gospel be unadulterated in me. And so I am with you in this. God, help me to be pure, to be a real light to this world. So all I want, to, want you to do today is to ask the Lord, ask yourself to look inside and say, am I ashamed? Am I living out the gospel? Can, can people know that I am a Christian just from, from looking? Have I ever said anything? Have I given any clues to my family, to those around me? Am I living out loud my faith? Would you just stop for a moment and talk to the Lord? Just ask Him to help you grow in this area. Stripes, we are healed by His nail pierced hands with free. By his blood, we're washed clean. Now we have a victory. The power of sin is broken. Jesus overcame it all. He has won our freedom. Jesus has won.
is risen.